Hey everybody, it's David. So it's been a while since we did a Q&A video here on the Cool Words channel. So today I'm going to go over some of the questions that you've been asking on our videos and responding directly to you right here. But first I just want to give a really big thanks to Dr. Mark Kushner and Dr. Sarah Ballard who recently shot some guest videos on the Cool Worlds channel. So if you haven't seen those yet, you can click here to check those out. Let's jump straight into the questions and there's a question here from Justin Taylor asking about the Proxima Centauri video we shot and he is wondering, are there any hints from the Kepler data as to what the occurrence rate of Earth-sized planets are around late M dwarfs? And if so, is it similar to that which we see for the early M dwarfs? So just as a reminder for those of you who don't know, M dwarfs are stars which are fairly similar to the Sun, except that they are smaller. And they could be anything from 50% the mass of the Sun all the way down to 10% the mass of the Sun. So this is a fairly broad category, and taxonomically the way astronomers define these different extremes of this category is that the smallest stars are called late M dwarfs and the largest stars on the end of the scale are called the early M dwarfs. So the late M dwarfs, which are the small ones remember, are very small, they have these very timid nuclear furnaces inside them and therefore they're very faint and so even with a telescope like Kepler it's really difficult to go and find planets around them except for the very closest late M dwarfs. So Kepler didn't see enough late M dwarfs in order to give a definitive statistical answer as to the occurrence rate of planets around those types of stars, but it did have enough of the earlier types. So these larger M dwarfs were surveyed by Kepler, and the best reference to that is Dressing and Charbonneau 2015, who find that about one in six of those stars have Earth-like planets orbiting them. I'll put a link in the description below. So to come back to your question, Justin, then the early type M dwarfs, yes, we know the answer and planets are pretty common. For the late type M dwarfs, we don't know yet, but I expect that K2 and TESS might be able to deliver an answer on that. I want to say that I think one of the most remarkable things about these M dwarfs is that they make up 75% of all stars in the universe, they live much longer than sun-like stars, and they seem to have more Earth-like planets going around them than sun-like stars. So everything is working in their favour and it sometimes makes me wonder as to why we weren't born living around an M dwarf. Why do we live around a yellow dwarf? Okay, so moving on to the next question, which is also about the Proxima video we shot. Milky Way and wants to know, wouldn't the detectability also depend on whether its planetary plane was similar to that of the solar system? Yeah, that's exactly right. You actually require two things. You require A, there's a planet there in the first place, and then B, that that planet has the correct orbital alignment so that we see it pass in front, transit its host star. Now, if you remember from the video, the type of system we're looking for sort of resembles that of Kepler 42 and TRAPPIST-1, and these are these very compact planetary systems going around these red dwarfs. So I think it's fairly easy to convince yourself that if a planetary system is compact, which means that the planet is very close to the star, the probability of it being seen to transit its host star is higher. So to convince yourself of this, just imagine the opposite case, where you have a planet and a star really, really far away from each other, and now to get the angle just right so that they're seen to eclipse requires very fine tuning, which means it's a low probability event. Vice versa, if they're very, very close together, it's actually really easy. So in the case of Proxima, there's about a 10% a priori probability of seeing a planetary system like Kepler-42 transit. Now there are other methods of detecting planets apart from the transit technique, such as radio velocities, and there you don't require the alignment to be quite so finely tuned. However, you are less sensitive to the really small planets. So you can think of transits as being like the high-risk, high-gain science. Okay, so moving on to the next question, which is on the polluted dead stars video that Dr. Ballard shot. Josh Plumridge asks, how cold is space really, and how are we going to end toxic dumping on white dwarfs? By the way, I know that Sarah really enjoyed that cool space lady comment you threw in there. Okay, so very quickly for the temperature question, in order to define a temperature in the conventional sense, we have to have some atoms or some molecules which are vibrating, and that really defines temperature. So completely empty space actually doesn't really have a temperature in that sense of the word. However, if you imagine a piece of rock floating around in space, then its temperature is going to be dependent upon basically how far away from a heat source it is. So if it's at the same distance from the sun that the Earth is, then more or less it will be the same temperature as the Earth. And in terms of how are we going to end toxic dumping on these white dwarfs, 
Well, I guess we really have no influence on that. I mean, this is a natural process which is occurring many, many light years away from us. So there's no way we can stop that process from happening. Next question on the same video, Milky Way in asks, could the expanding bubble of gas cast off when the star becomes a white dwarf slow the orbit of planets enough that they might spiral in? That's a great question, and right now, understanding how planets and planetesimals can get so close to these dead stars that they literally fall into them is an area of open and active research, which means that we actually don't know conclusively the answer just yet. There's a great review article by Dimitri Veras who explores all the different avenues which have been proposed that might make planets and planetesimals get really close to dead stars, and I'll put a link down in the description below for that. But you're right that the gas, and not only the gas, but also the debris disk, the dust basically, that's left over around these white dwarfs will be a source of drag and it will cause these planets to migrate inwards if they feel that drag force. But another big change which has happened is that the star itself, in the death throes of its final years, has lost a significant fraction of its mass. So for example in the solar system, obviously we have eight planets orbiting the sun, and if the mass of the sun suddenly decreased, then it's going to affect the orbits of those planets, and it might lead to dynamical instabilities, which could ultimately cause some planets to maybe get ejected, and some planets to fall all the way in into that star. So there's a number of ways you can do this, but I will say in summary that theorists are able to explain how you might be able to take the types of planetary systems that Kepler has found, and make them fall into dead stars. I mean, you can think of ways to do it. So thank you so much for all those questions. I really believe that answering questions directly to you in this way is something which makes our outreach channel very unique compared to other outreach forms. I mean, we don't just want to have a one-way lecture, we want to have a conversation with you. I want to quickly thank Dan Allen, who left an endorsing comment on the Game of Thrones video that we shot last week. Dan was actually one of the co-authors of that paper that we talked about, so I'm really pleased that he saw the video. So apart from those of you who have left questions on our channel, let me also take a moment to thank all of you who have left supportive comments on our channel and thank yous. So especially Geordie B, Autumn 000, Rafik Bourne, Eddie Bosnick, Dorian Illy, Milky Wayan, and Teresa. Thank you so much. We hope to have another video coming your way by the end of this week. So to make sure you get that and all the other videos from the Cool Words Lab, if you haven't already, make sure you click the subscribe button below. So as always, if you like and share this video with your friends, we sincerely appreciate it. If you want to interact with us in the comments below, then of course we really encourage that too. And thank you again so much for watching and stay curious.